They're online now. Hi everyone. Just let me know. Okay, see if it's online. Hi everyone. Um, thank you for joining our data science webinar. Uh, the webinar is sponsored by ASA Statistics and Marketing section. If you are not a member of ASA Statistics and Marketing, please consider joining us as a member. ASA provides incredible resources about stats and data science. You can go to findthiscafe.com. Um, there's a link here to join our section. You can also see more detail about the talk. There's a list of our previous talks and recordings. If you are interested in any of those, you are more than welcome to check it out. If you participate in the leaf broadcasting, you can submit your question using the chat function on YouTube. Today, we have Professor Liu Liu talk about an application of a very hot topic, deep learning. Use deep learning to extract brand image on social media. Liu Liu is an assistant professor of marketing at the University of Colorado Bowder, right? Colorado Bowder? Yeah. Yeah, she worked for Google before, so she has both experience in industry and academia. Now, without further ado, I will turn it to Professor Liu Liu. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, so first, thanks to Hui for organizing this webinar. And also thanks, everyone, for uh, joining with us today. So my name is uh, Liu. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of marketing at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Uh, so nowadays, uh, people are so obsessed with visuals, right? So we take photos and we share them on social media. In this research, what we do is extracting meaningful brand insights from the photos that consumers created on social media, on Instagram, uh, using machine learning. This is a joint work uh, with Daria from uh, NIU uh, Stern School of Business and Natalie from University of Washington. So uh, imagine you are the brand manager of Old Navy. You are uh, managing the official account on Instagram and you prepared a lot of photos to show to your consumers and to communicate the idea that Old Navy is fun and lovely. So you want to portray Old Navy as a fun brand on social media. However, as you start searching Old Navy on Instagram, you realize that actually these photos are not the only photos that your consumers see. There are a lot of photos created by other users on Instagram. And there are a lot of them. Now, as a brand manager, you start to wonder, right, so how is my brand portrayed in these consumer photos? Is it portrayed the same as how I want to portray it, like very fun and lovely? Or do they communicate a different brand image? As a brand manager, what can I learn from these consumer-created brand photos about my brand image? This is a very uh, timely question uh, for brand managers because right now, we're in the middle of this fundamental change in the forms of social conversation. So nowadays, people talk more and more through like image-based social media platform. We talk with each other through Facebook, through Snapchat, through Instagram, or maybe tomorrow there's a new image-based social media platform like on the rise. And there are just so many conversations there. Among these conversations, a lot of them are actually commercial related, are brand related. Consumers hashtag brands to communicate with brands, to um, associate brands uh, with their lives. And there are a lot of them. So for example, if you search the brand Nike, there are right now 53 million posts on Instagram that are hashtagged with Nike. And these uh, photos from consumers are not just a like, product picture with just product. Consumers actually put their lives in these photos. So they link the brands, the product, with their consumption experiences and usage context. So this actually provides researchers opportunities to learn about brand associations. And as a brand manager, if you don't know how consumers are approaching your brand, you are actually missing a big chunk of communication. So in academia, like researchers have long recognized the importance of listening in on consumer conversations, right? So we have a lot of research, previous research, 
and also most recent research on like how to like measure uh, you know brand mentions, brand co-occurrence, how can we identify customer needs uh, from product reviews. So most of them are still like doing tax money. And what they found is mostly about the functional attributes of product. So no one has listened to uh, consumer photos, like photos posted by consumers and shared on social media. And that is what we want to do in this research. So we want to bridge this gap by listening in on uh, consumer created brand photos. And specifically, we propose to measure a brand image portrayed on these consumer photos. So uh, here, I want to clarify a little bit uh, what I mean by uh, brand image. So when I say uh, we want to measure brand image, what we re really mean is we want to measure how brands are portrayed along intangible brand attributes. So these intangible brand attributes, if you think about the old classic, I mean the classic positioning maps, they are the axis of the positioning map, whether brand want to position, position themselves as glamorous, as uh, innovative, as elegant. So firms can use these intangible brand attributes for like, positioning and differentiation, especially with competitors uh, who have very functionally, you know, very functionally very similar products. So here, my goal is to measure how brands are portrayed along these intangible brand attributes. So for example, uh, is Eddie Bauer, the brand Eddie Bauer, portrayed as a glamorous, as a rugged brand? And how rugged do Eddie Bauer photo look like? Is Prada portrayed as a glamorous brand? So here, as I mentioned earlier, this consumer created brand photos is not just a product picture. It actually has consumers' life, has consumption experiences, and usage context. So as a researcher, we can uh, use this rich information to predict the brand intangibles. So for example, if you look at um, these two examples, like look at ID Power photo, it's a photo uh, posted by a consumer. So we not only know that there's the ID Bauer, uh, you know, the consumer wear ID Bauer. We also know she went out for hiking and now she's sitting on the, on the mountain and then facing like mountain and the rocky in the distance. So it conveys a feeling of ruggedness. But on contrast, the Prada photo, the photo hashtag with Prada, we see a woman uh, wearing Prada sunglasses with very bright red lipstick. So it conveys a very different feeling with, from the first one. So we always say, you know, like a picture is worth a thousand words. Here, uh, these consumption experiences, this rich information can actually allow us to measure brand intangibles, these brand attributes, brand image from these consumer photos. But now you might ask me, so why do we care about how consumer portray my brand? So why do I care about the brand image from these consumer photos? Well, in certain sense, actually consumers are co-creating brand image uh, for you on social media. So as a firm, you lose the monopoly power of you know, portraying your brand, of doing brand communication. And in certain sense, you can even consider these brand photos from consumers as consumer created image ads, like advertisement. Ultimately, they are going to shape your customers' perceptions and the choices of, of your brand. So my goal here is to provide a managers like a, a new metric about brand image from consumers. And by comparing, for example, how consumer portray a brand on social media with how firm portray the brand, we can allow firm to either correct a problem or a leverage and identify new opportunities. So for example, we can check whether the brand message from consumer photos is consistent with the brand message from the firm photos. If they are consistent, then great. We can leverage it, right? So here, um, consumers are actually doing free marketing for you. And we know that actually uh, users trust this organic content from consumers more. But even if they are like incons inconsistent, it could be a problem but could also be an opportunity. So uh, for example, thinking about the classic example of baking soda, where firm won't use baking soda for bakery, but consumer actually also use baking soda to remove order from refrigerator. Here, firm can identify a new usage context. 
to give an example in the I mean in the social media context, if I'm the brand manager of Jack Daniels, and if I see there are a lot of actually Jack Daniels is portrayed as glamorous with uh, women drinking Jack Daniels in pent night, then what can I infer from it? Well, it might be an opportunity for me. So I was targeting uh, male customers like rugged perceptions. But see, actually, we may also drink that Jack Daniels in like pen night. So maybe this is this is a new segment of customers, and I could create a sub brand to target this new segment with this new usage context. Or maybe it's also like it's still a problem, right? So maybe if I am a brand manager of Jack Jack Daniels and I still want a Jack Daniels to be perceived as rugged as masculine. Then this is a you know signal that you know I should do some action to uh, crack this perception, right? So because by the end of the day, what is a brand? A brand is a bunch of associations. So you care about what is associated with your brand. I hope by now uh, you are convinced that actually, uh, if we can measure how consumers portray brand on social media, from can actually learn a lot of like rich insights about their brands. But the question is. How to measure these brand attributes? How to measure these brand intangibles uh, from photos? Because, like here, what we, are, what we are dealing with are images, are photos, which are very different from text, for example. So, when computers is image, they are a bunch of pixels with numbers, right? So, the data is very unstructured. So, that's why it requires new methods from machine learning to solve this problem. To give an overview of what we do in this research and sort of our contributions. So, here uh, we proposed, we asked, and also answered three questions one after another. The so first is like, given there are so many consumer photos on social media, what to listen to? What can we learn from these consumer photos? Here we propose that we can measure brand image, brand intangibles portrayed on consumer photos so that we create a new metric. About the consumer co created brand image. And then the question is how to measure it? Here we are going to give you a method to measure brand attributes from photos using a deep learning, which is a very new and emerging field in machine learning. Specifically, we trained a convolutional neural network from, uh, for brand attributes. And finally, is the so what question, right? So, what insights are generated from this? I mean, consumer photos on social media uh, by applying, if we apply the method on photos on social media. So, here we apply our methods to uh, run the photos uh, from consumers on Instagram. And we measure, uh, we apply the methods to consumer photos to measure how consumer portray the brand. We also apply the methods to firm photos because they have official accounts on Instagram to measure how firm portray their brand. And thirdly, we have a survey metric from a large like national uh, company who are doing like brand perception survey. So here we did the three-way comparison. You know, compare consumer with firm with survey, and to give a preview of our results, what we found is that first, uh, the brand image on social media, how consumer portray your brand. In general, reflect the perception survey. I mean, how consumer answer the perception survey. But by comparing this different brand metric, firm can actually either identify important brand attributes or uh, identify gaps in, the, in their positioning strategy. So, for example, I want a consumer to think my brand in this way, actually, they think it in another way. So, by using this method, consumer can, I mean, firm can identify the gaps. So, so okay, so. Now uh, I think I gave you this, you know, the motivation, the introduction, and the, the bigger picture of uh, what we do. Uh, next, uh, I'm going to go to the specifics. So tell you specifically about, you know, what method and how I apply the method to the you know, Instagram photos. But before I dive into the, I mean, the specifics, I want to know whether any one of you um, has, you know, has questions about uh, the first part, the background. And have questions. Just give some something. Okay. <laughs> it, it may be a little lag. Sounds great. Uh, so, uh, so I hope by now you are convinced that this is an important problem. If we can like measure brand uh, attributes from consumer photos, 
So as I said next, I'm going to tell you more about the specifics. And specifically, um, we're going to do it in two stage. So in the stage one, I'm going to tell you uh, the methods to measure brand attributes from photos. So here uh, is actually an image classification problem. We need two things. We need the data, and also we need algorithm. And to illustrate the method, we work with uh, four brand attributes, which are glamorous, rugged, healthy, and fun. So they are from the brand perception survey I told you earlier, because I want to use the same attributes so that we can do comparison between them. And then once we have a method to predict brand attributes from any photos, we in the, in the second stage, we apply the method to Instagram photos. So here, uh, we have the data for two categories, for apparel and the beverages. And we have the three types of metrics from consumer photos, from firm photos, from the perception survey. And I'm going to tell you specifically about the empirical studies I did uh, for checking the consistency and also show you some cool uh, brand maps, actually positioning maps, created from uh, this new metric from consumer photos. So on the bigger picture level, the first stage uh, you can consider as, you know, we start with photos where we know the labels. So it's a supervised machine learning method, right? So we start with photos where we have the labels and we learn the functional mapping, uh, like a FX function to map the photos to uh, labels. How do you get the label to start with? You just ask people manually label them? Thank you for the segue. So actually I'm going to tell you very soon. Okay. Yeah, get the label, uh, the pictures. So yes, once we have the label pictures, we train algorithms, and then we apply the algorithm in the second stage to Instagram photos where we don't have labels, right? So now we have the white hat where we the predicted uh, brand attributes. So we, then we can uh, make insights from this new metric. So to start with the first stage, um, here, as I said, is actually an image classification problem. And the goal is that if you give me any image, I'm going to tell you does it convey ruggedness? Does it convey glamour? Does it convey things are healthy? And we need uh, first a large set of image labeled with brand attributes um, so that uh, we can train the algorithm. And then we need to have an algorithm. To answer Chris's question, uh, for the image data set, actually now, yeah, we don't have data set, existing data set for these brand attributes. So we have a lot of data set for you know, object detection, like cats, dogs, train, flower, um, but not for this brand intangible, so we have to collect one by our own. Here, I'll re refer to Flickr search engine to collect such a data set. So what we do is we, uh, we are going to query the attribute for example, healthy to get the photos, I mean, the top re return results to get the photos which are healthy. And then we query the antonyms, like unhealthy, to get the photos which are not, because we need both the positive and the negative instances to learn how to separate and how to classify uh, images. And here, let me show you some example we collected for the four brand attributes we work out with. Um, so for each uh, brand attribute, we collect about a 4,000 image, half positive and half negative. Now uh, we have the label, the data set. So next, we're going to use this data set to train algorithms to learn how to you know, separate uh, and positive from negatives. And here, as I mentioned earlier, what we are dealing with are photos, which are very unstructured. Because photos is very different from text. If you think about text, um, they consist of words, right? Like every word has a meaning. They can group into topics, and they can make, in, make insights from topics. But here, when computer sees image, is a bunch of pixels. It's like you know, thousands of even millions of pixels. But each number doesn't really make any sense. So we really need a like, method to, uh, to represent image in, a certain, in some meaningful way, to extract features in a meaningful way to represent it first. And here I'm going to tell you uh, two type of methods uh, to solve the problem. And these two type of methods, one is um, the new like, deep learning, uh, which is like very emerging uh, field in machine learning. And the other method is called a support back machine, which is uh, more like a traditional type of machine learning method. And so to uh, give some like insight about the difference of, between these two methods and also like why we use two of them. So with like traditional type of method, like a support vector machine, uh, we work with like pictures, like lot of pixels. The first step as a researcher or like as you know, who work with the image, 
we need to find a way, we need to create features to represent image. So we create handcraft features to represent image. And then we feed the features to, you know, everybody to learn how to do predictions. But with the new uh, deep learning method, we can actually learn both the features and the predictive models at the same time. So I'm going to tell you more details like later as I, you know, open the black box for you. And uh, both methods actually have been uh, used in marketing before on uh, different, you know, uh, areas. And as I mentioned earlier, the biggest difference actually between these two methods are we support the back machine because researcher define the features. It's more interpretable. By the way, deep learning is like, it's, it's sort of a black box compared with the back machine in terms of feature, but it's more accurate in literature. I want to start with a uh, support back machine because I want, I think it, it's going to provide you more intuition about how to work with image. So here we start with a raw uh, image, input image, like this uh, photo, like women, this Eddie Bauer photo. And we know the label, which is like, it's a rugged photo. And we extract three types of features related to the color, the shape, and the texture of the image. So color, shape, texture has been widely used in the literature of computer vision for object detection and recognition. They are also among the fundamental design elements. So we think they are relevant for this, you know, brand intent or this perceptual uh, feelings. For colors, for example, we extract, you know, there are very standard features like histograms of color in different color space, for example, percentage of green color. Uh, for shape, we extract, you know, directions of lines, um, because we know like actually, for example, different direction for lines actually convey different feelings. Straight lines feels like firm, uh, while horizontal lines feels very peaceful, right? We also extract uh, texture features uh, to describe, you know, how do you feel when you see a picture? Does it feel smooth? Once we extract uh, these features, we can put them into this feature vector, this X vector, X vector where uh, each variable is corris and corresponds to uh, one specific you know, feature. And now we are actually back to the old problem where we have the X, we have the Y, the label. And our goal is to learn how to separate uh, you know, the positive X from the, I mean, the positive data from the negative data. Here we use the support back machine methods. And it's, if you don't know much about SVM, it's basically it's very similar to logic regression. But it just has a different, you know, uh, objective function. I don't. So, I still don't understand how to get those features um, to be vectors. Pixel is is easier to understand um, if it's color, it's a number. But how how to get shape out of? For example, uh, let me. Uh, so there are certain methods to. For example, it's also based on pixels. Let me give you an example. Of, for example, the local binary pattern. How to measure texture. So if you have the pixel value of, uh, let's think about picture, a like two-dimensional picture, and then every position has a pixel value, right? Yeah. And then if I'm the central pixel value, I'm here, and then I can compare my pixel value with my neighbors. So if my, 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 my neighbors, the pixel value is the same as me, so this is a smooth area. If, you know, if half of them is the same, but the other half is different, then it actually indicates maybe there's a line. Um, or if you know you can actually measure for example smoothness like texture just by comparing like pixel values and it's the same for shape and there's also actually certain type of you know uh, filters to do specific transformation of the pixel values from the pixel values to more a uh, meaningful representation to capture the sense of the picture so if a total pixel in the picture um, for example, it's 28 multiplied 28. So actually have three 28 multiplied 28 stack up. Is that right? Yeah, the raw data, for example, if the, the, the height and the width is 28 by 28, then the raw data is raw need to time the three different the three channels, the three color channels. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, but, but it's true, actually, I think you're asking a good question, which is, uh, you know, there are so many ways of computing features, actually. You might disagree with me, you know, why do you use just, just use color, shape, and texture? I actually think you should use object, object-based features, right? You should detect whether 
there's a woman in the picture. If there's a woman, maybe it's more glamorous. Yeah. And indeed, you know, like with this traditional type of machine learning method, feature engineering is very important. You have to find a way, a good way to represent the image first. And that is also actually what the deep learning is better at. So actually, uh, deep learning can do automatic feature extraction. So it can actually learn uh, both the prediction problem to predict, for example, an attributes, and also find, extract the best set of features for the prediction problem. And the way it does this is because deep learning is also a representation learning method. It can represent you know, the raw data like, through like hierarchy of concepts, like, like you know, it's trying to more and more abstract uh, representation of the data. So for example, I think many of you might have seen this example from you know, deep learning literature where if the input to the deep learning model are human faces or like in general pictures, then in the early layers, what the network detects are very local features like edges and corners. But as you go deeper and deeper into the layers, into the hidden layers, they can extract more abstract features like you know part of faces and eventually faces. Finally, they can do facial I mean, face recognition. And the way it does this in general is because it can model this very complex, complicated, you know, this relationship between the raw data and the output through many simple nonlinear transformation. So it has many layers, right? And each layer is actually just doing a very simple uh, transformation. So for example, compute some like matrix multiplication and then through uh, and then through some nonlinear transformation. But the key is that it does this again and again and again, so that it can, it can actually model very complicated relationship between the input and output. So this is what deep learning is in general. And this has been used in many, you know, in actually a lot of industries, I would say. And I worked at Google before, and before when I was working there, so they didn't use, deep learning was not quite popular at that time. So we use more uh, other standard, you know, uh, machine learning method, but what I heard is that actually a lot of the method now is replaced with deep learning models because they do perform better. And here, uh, to solve uh, to solve my problem, uh, I trained uh, a type of neural network called convolutional neural network, which is a type of neural network for uh, image-related task. So for example, the input to my network are the image in pixels, uh, and then the output at the final layer are two output, whether, for example, the weather is rugged or not rugged. It's a binary uh, classification. And I hope you're not scared by this, you know, many layers, many numbers, many squares. The difference between this network and the one I just showed you is now, like, every node in the layer is connected to, uh, like, just a local area in the previous layer. So this is, this is to mimic, so in sort of like when they when the researchers in deep learning, they first designed this type of neural network, they're inspired by how human vision system works. For example, now, although I can see, you know, a lot of things in my office right now, I can see, uh, you know, the screen, I can see my wall, I can see my, uh, my desk, but actually at every moment, my vision, I only focus on just a small region in, from what I see, and then there's neurons to some computation of it, and then pass the signal, to other neurons and then they do some computation of it and then do it again and again and again. So this is like how convolutional neural networks, uh, convolutional neural, net neural network, sorry, uh, works. And, uh, but as you can see, it's a very like complicated network. It requires a lot of data. And now we know if you are familiar with, for example, the ImageNet challenge and also a lot of work from computer science, they actually have, you know, huge data set with millions of uh, label the data. Uh, if you, you recall, what I have for my application is actually the data is very small. So how can we, you know, train a like reasonable network? You know, how can we learn the parameters? Here I use a specific type of, you know, a type of technique called transfer learning to uh, transfer uh, knowledge from one domain to a similar domain. So uh, it's actually very similar you can think about if you're doing, if you're familiar with Bayesian, for example, Bayesian learning, is is the similar as when you set a prior for the model. Instead of set a random prior, to let the model start from a random place, you can actually uh, fit with an uh, informative prior, right? And here in the context of training my neural network, I can initialize the initial parameter from 
some pre-trained models. Uh, models trained on relevant application with more data. Here I use two sets of you know, initial parameters. One is from uh, image net model uh, for uh, object classification task, which trained on millions of models. And the other is for is from a Flickr style model, which was trained for style recognition. So what we do is actually we are gonna train the model when we do the transfer learning. We are gonna train the model, you know, initial the model parameters with these two sets of uh, parameters from the pre-trained models. And then when we train the models uh, for the early layers where we borrow the parameters, we're gonna use a small learning rate, meaning we're gonna train it very slowly because we wanna, we wanna, we wanna preserve as much knowledge from the pre-trained model as possible. Because if you think about what the network learned in early layers, they learn about you know, the local field like edges, corners, lines, they are useful for any type of application. So we want to preserve that. But for the last layer, for later layers, we're going to use a bigger learning rate, meaning that we want to train the model faster and more from our own data, because we want to adapt the network to our application. So I trained the, the, the network uh, on NIU uh, high performance cluster when I was uh, still a student at NIU um, using the Cafe Deep Learning Framework. So it actually finished very quickly because we uh, started with a uh, you know, very good pre-trained model. And here uh, is the learning curve, sort of like we want to check whether the model converge, where the horizontal um, axes are uh, the training iterations and the Y axis, uh, so the red line, for example, is the training loss. As you or you can understand it as training errors. As you can see, with more and more training iteration, the model gradually converge. So the you know the error becomes small and small, and finally. And now uh, we have our model trained. Uh, as we are doing a prediction problem, right? We want to predict if you give me any image, whether it's glamorous, whether it's rugged, and uh, we want to check the accuracy, the model performance. Here, uh, we train the model using 80% of the data, and then we test it out of sample. Okay. I'm showing you the out of sample, out of sample performance uh, from uh, different types of model, from SVM uh, and also from deep learning, the two uh, convolutional neural network. As you can see, uh, all of them actually uh, is about 50% first. Uh, recall our training set is half positive, half negative, so 50% is what you get by uh, random guessing. And then comparing different methods, the deep learning method indeed worked the best with an average about like 80%. And the one uh, transferred from the Flickr style model works the best. Uh, so my intuition is that because the Flickr style model, the application is more similar to ours, it's about perceptual feelings. Although SVM is not as good as a deep learning model in terms of prediction accuracy, but uh, it also it can also provide some interpretable results, right? So what we do is actually actually train the models only using color, or only using shape, or only using texture to see uh, how predictive you know does each does each you know is does each uh, feature work. So for example, how predictive you can only use color features to predict healthy. Turns out for healthy color is actually already a very good feature. So, so now, actually, by now, I tell you everything about the method. And if you give me any photo, I can make a prediction about the brand tools. Recall our ultimate goal are the brand photos on social media. So we want to understand how brands are portrayed. So next, um, I'm going to apply the method to Instagram photos. We are going to the second stage. So here, um, I work with uh, 56 brands from uh, two categories on Instagram, from apparel and beverages. The reason to choose these two categories is because consumers really share a lot of photos for these two categories, right? So think about, you probably won't write, um, I, you know, I feel very rugby today uh, wearing my jeans, my like, like Levi's jeans, but you might wear your like, Levi's jeans in a very rugby environment. So we want to you know, capture that from these apparel photos and marriage photos. And uh, when I collect photos, I collect two types of photos from Instagram. One is the organic photos from consumers, like consumer hashtag brands on Instagram. So for each brand, I collect about uh, 2,000 images. And 
we collect it, we remove the you know the photos from shops, from resale, because they are not authentic. They has this commercial purpose. So the second set of photos I collect is from a firm, because nowadays firm also have official Instagram account. So we collect photos from their official Instagram account, uh, and up with like about seventy two thousand photos for the brands I have in this data set. So now I have these two types of photos, and for each brand, for example, I actually have thousands of photos, right? And what we do is like for each brand and for each this image, I'm gonna make a prediction whether this image can lay, for example, rugged, ruggedness or not. And then we compute this percentage metric, so pretend percentage of images that express the brand attribute as our uh, image, like photo-based brand metric. For example, in the beverage categories, for Jack Daniels, 57% of this image are predicted as rugged, but only 30% are predicted as healthy. This like confirms with our intuition because Jack Daniels is a whiskey brand, it's like rugged and masculine. On contrast, Tazo, which is a tea brand, 36% are rugged, but over 50%, like 50% are healthy. So this really match our intuition. But of course, I'm going to show you, uh, you know, the prediction from all the brands and then what we learn from all the brands prediction. But before going into the, 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 I mean, the details of the results, I want to remind you that here we are dealing with three uh, related but very different brand metrics. So we have the predictions from consumer photos, you know, which is about uh, the brand image conveyed from consumer photos is about the consumption experiences, the usage context, you know, the brand associations with consumer lives. We also have, I mean, the firm created brand photos. So that metric is, is about, you know, firm's marketing effort to communicate and to create brand identity. So it's part of a firm's this marketing, overall marketing effort. And thirdly, I, um, I had, I introduced a third measure. So we have this brand perception survey from uh, a large company called Young and Rubicons. So they have this brand asset evaluator where they have asked a lot of consumers, like participants, so how do you perceive brand? So for example, you know, we have, we have like hundreds of brands, we have a lot of attributes. Does this brand, do you perceive this brand as glamorous? Do you perceive this brand as rugged? So next I'm gonna compare uh, these three different metrics. Uh, to see what can we learn from them. Specifically, I did two types of empirical studies. So first, uh, I'm going to check the consistency between different brand metrics on category level. And then I'm gonna show you some brand maps. So on the category level, uh, what we do is that we're gonna compare whether um, different metrics give the same rank prediction. So for example, if I have a a pair of brands like you know Adibar and Prada, do um, different brand metrics uh, predict the same rank? So for example, do consumer predict Adibar more rugged than Prada? Uh, do firm predict the same Adibar more rugged than Prada? And then do brand perception predict the same? I'm gonna count the percentage of pairs where the two metrics give the same rank. And uh, here, uh, let me show the result. So we can see actually in these two categories, um, across different comparison, like between consumer and perception survey, between consumer and forum. Uh, so there is over 50% uh, brand pairs, uh, you know, are all about, like, are consistent. But there's also, like, difference in different categories. So for example, for apparel, uh, we see high consistency between uh, different brand metrics for uh, rugged and for glamour and also for fun. But for beverages, we actually see very big uh, consistency for healthy. This also makes sense, right? Because for apparel, glamour, rugged, and fun, maybe it's more relevant uh, than healthy. We also, for a robustness check, we also check like Pearson correlation. And we indeed also find a like strong, actually significant uh, correlation between different metrics. So here, the take home message is that we see this overall convergence between uh, different brand metrics, which indicate brand image, how consumer portray brand on social media reflect their perception on the survey. But next, I wanna look deeper into the specific brand, right? You know, how, how am I portrayed relative to my competitors? Who are my competitors from these consumer photos? 
So here, uh, I draw brand maps from this um, brand metrics. So first, let me show you a brand map from the beverage category. So here, what I do is like for each brand, I have uh, the predictions, right? So whether this brand is uh, looks rugged, looks glamorous, looks uh, healthy, looks fun, based on their, their consumer photos. And then we did principal component analysis to uh, map them into the first two principal components so that I can visualize the data. And if you look closely to this brand map, you can see actually, uh, oh, by the way, I also draw the original attribute to the map to have like better understanding of the meaning of dimensions. And if you see uh, the map closely, you can see actually the teas, for example, the water and juices, the alcohol and the soda drinks are clearly separated. So just, just let me remind you that when we create this brand map, we didn't use any text information. So, so there's no brand mentions, there's no brand co-occurrence, there's no, no comments or any hashtag information. This is purely from the photos that consumers on social media, purely from the raw image content. So this means that there are indeed brand informations from these consumer photos and our metric, our methods is able to pick it up. So, so this is, for me, I feel like this is like very cool because before I do this research, I actually have no idea, you know, what we are going to get from these consumer photos because I thought there are information there, but there are also so much noise there, right? So this actually, uh, this brand map gave us some face validity uh, for the research. So next, uh, I'm going to show you some comparisons between different brand maps. Here, the first comparison, for example, is between brand perception survey and consumer photos. To illustrate the points I want to deliver to you, I remove all the brands. Here, I only keep the attributes mapping. Here, the, the, the longer the attribute, meaning the, the, the more variation you see along this dimension. So from the brand perception survey, we see actually there's not much differentiation, differentiation along Rocket. But on consumer photos, there's actually a lot of differentiation. So what does this mean? It means like, you know, there's a lot of differentiation on these consumer photos when they portray a brand. So maybe Rocket is a relevant attribute when you think about, you know, doing differentiation from your competitors. And so this is what you can identify by comparing, you know, these brand attributes. But also you can compare brands. Here, uh, I'm going to give you an example, like, you know, on the beverage category. So you can also, so we also have like, some example from the uh, apparel category. But with the beverage category, um, if you uh, look at uh, the brand Fanta. So from the firm photos, Fanta is closely cluttered with Dr. Pepper and Coca-Cola, uh, which is the same from what you get from brand perception survey, that the Fanta is close together with Dr. Pepper and Coca-Cola. So this is a match our intuition, right? So they are like soda drinks. But if you look at the consumer photos, you know, the brand perception map from consumer photos, Fanta is actually not quite close to Dr. Pepper and Coca-Cola. And what Fanta is, I mean, what is close to Fanta is actually Snapple and vitamin water. So after a second thought, I also think this is also makes sense, right? So actually, when you think about when you ask consumers, you know, when, when I ask you, so how do you perceive Fanta in the survey? You might think mm, there's this, I'm doing a survey, and then Fanta is this unhealthy soda drink. But actually, in your daily life, the way you consume Fanta, the, the consumption experiences, the usage context, is probably more similar to water and the juices. And in this case, maybe like Fanta can actually position along water and the juices. So, so here, what I want to tell you is like by using this method, you can identify these new insights from consumer photos. Potentially, there are many reasons behind that. You know, it might be because um, even the sample population sample is different. Maybe like on Instagram is more younger generation, and so this is how they use the brand, how they perceive the brand. By the way, from perception survey, is this the national population? Or maybe because on Instagram, they are the real users because I have to use the, the brand, I have to be the consumer of the brand to show, to post pictures. But with the survey, actually, anyone can answer the survey, even if I'm, I'm not aware of the brand. So there are indeed many reasons behind the why, but the, the, I want to show you is that with this new metric, actually, we can identify this new information 
which form can start from here to go deeper into uh, you know why this happens and what what shall I do like in future. So uh, to to summarize, uh, what I show in this research is that uh, photos consumers share on social media contain valuable brand information, and we have this proposed proposed this image mining methods, these two stage methods, to extract this uh, brand attributes from consumer photos. And overall, we found this overall convergence of brand image, but uh, by the comparison, we can also identify some differences with certain brand and attributes where firm can you know start from there to change their positioning strategies or you know targeting strategies. So that's actually uh, pretty much for this work. Uh, but I'm also doing something uh, new, which is which aligns with this work, which is if you think about what I do in this research, which is to listen to consumer I mean the brand photos, we where we treat each brand as a bunch of photos. We, we represent each brand as a bunch of photos. But nowadays, actually, each consumer, each, each of us, each user, each human being, we can also be represented by a bunch of photos, right? So here I'm showing you my Instagram account. Um, by looking into my Instagram account, the photos I share, you can see I'm a person who loves nature. Yes, I'm at Boulder now, but yeah, I've been, yeah, I'm very into nature. So, uh, so we can do this image-based targeting as targeting, right? So we can measure uh, this personality, this personality trait from the photos you post, and then target a brand to you, target brands and match your personality. So what we do first is we did some experiments in the lab where we launched a Chinese tea drink in US. Uh, we have these two conditions. In one condition, the tea drink, uh, you know, the brand personality match with the the, your, your personal trait and the other condition it doesn't match and we indeed find you know in the matching condition we see a high significant high increase uh, in terms of purchase likelihood so of course this is just an initial start uh, we do it in lab uh, with experiment but uh, I'm in the future in the near future I'm gonna do it like in real life with like real data and if any of you um, you know want to work together or if you have you know opportunity to, to the experiment like field experiment or real data um, i'm very happy to talk more about it and then uh, yeah to start a collaboration so uh Hui, i think that's what i have today for the uh, webinar so does anyone have question or do you have any questions so, yeah. yep um there's a question asking when labeling are are there some photos that are giving weights such as 70% foam, 30% rugged? Is that something that can be used to increase classification accuracy? Oh, I see, I see. Uh, so now I, I think there are two, uh, two aspects. To answer your question, there are two points. So the first point is that uh, when we uh, have the label, it's a, yeah, it's a banner classification. So basically, we, we don't we didn't we didn't treat it as a regression problem. We didn't read you know on a scale from one to seven how glamorous it is. Yeah. Mean one mean not glamorous at all. Seven mean very glamorous. So we actually collect binary labels, meaning do you think it's glamorous one or not zero? And then the second point I want to say is that actually we do it as a binary classification problem instead of a multinomial instead of a multi category classification. So here we actually for each attribute we train the model to predict whether for glamorous we predict whether it's glamorous or not glamorous. For rugged, we predict whether it's rugged or not rugged. So we didn't predict, you know, one model to predict whether it's whether it's from whether it's rugged or glamorous or healthy or fun. The reason is because um, so they are not mutually ex exclusive attributes. So a picture could be both glamorous and fun. So that's, yeah, that's, that's what we uh, do for. Uh, I think if you treat it as regression model, like use weights on each one, it will be very hard to validate it. Right now you can compare it to the survey and it's hard to like do survey on one to seven. I guess you can do that just too much for people to respond, I think. I, th I, think, mm, okay, I think you can still do it. So basically again, it's two stages. So in the first stage, when you have regression metric, then the evaluation should be on something like root mean square error to, you know, to measure the distance between your prediction and then your, your labeled rating, your labeled in the, the, the continuous metric. 
And then the second stage, so instead of using the percentage metric we, where we propose, because we have the one zero label, we use percentage metric. Here you can use some you know weighted average, you know, average of the ratings. So again, once you have the average of the you know the ratings, you can still do comparison to check correlation. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for the rugged, I for the rugged, it's very interesting to see that um uh, in the survey it doesn't have too much variation. And in the real case, it has a lot of variation. I was wondering, is that because part of psychology problem like when you when you tag a, a picture as rugged it can be environment it doesn't have to connect to the brand um, but if you do the survey you ask directly about the brand so actually human brand um wild differently on on rugged Be like if you look at firm and healthy that's very straightforward that's more connected to the brand instead of environment yeah, it could be a problem. It could be a reason because I think maybe the environment has a lot of information about the rugged. But actually, with for example, with some alcohol like you know, Jack Daniels or like a drink like a Monster, they are pretty rugged, I would say. So, yeah, there are. I, I'm not sure what's the reason behind that. So I think that's something. Once you have this metric, that's something you can you know. Actually, sometimes I think about machine learning for marketing or for social science is. It's also about we actually propose new hypotheses, right? So it's like you have data, and then with this method, I can give you so so that you can ask new questions you couldn't ask before. Yeah. it, and then so we can also give you newer questions. So it's like iteration between hypothesis proposal and then hypothesis test. Yeah. Are there a lot of applications of uh, those deep learning method in real case, like industry? I think, for example, like uh, as I mentioned, like in Google, like I think some products, at, at least the product I worked before, like doing like ice prediction, I think they are moving to using deep learning. And then uh, I also know, for example, for some um, like like image, not even like medical image, okay. to predict like you know some scan, long scan, something like that. They can also use deep learning to make better predictions. So I would say. Um, People want to use it more and more, and um, and it indeed work. But there's also concerns about you know whether it's too black box. What if there's something goes wrong? How can I um, debug it? You know what caused it wrong? So it's yeah, <laughs> trade offs between adopting and not adopting. And do you think it it will be automated um to to big extent because I think Google has a product called Autumn ML. Yeah, yeah. I do think actually that is also one thing I really like. Um, you know, um, computer science researchers and also you know people in industry because they really make the tool very easy to access and to use. So there are not only the you know the things from Google. I think maybe also from Amazon. Yeah, I think there are more and more such uh, platforms or API that you can uh, use for your, if you don't want to do the development that's all. Yeah. Sure. Are there any other questions from the audience? So one last call. All right, I don't see more questions coming. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much for amazing. And thanks everyone. For, thank uh, you everyone for joining us. Have a great day, everybody. Um, if I can, or I think we are off. Wait a second, just make sure we are off. Um, sure. Oh, 